OK, we seem to have settled. Let's make a start. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third of our Foundation Project webinars. Uh, lots of you have very loyally come to them all, so welcome back to you and welcome to anyone who's come along specially uh, for today. Um, we've been highlighting the sort of interim progress of all of our uh, foundation projects through their interim reports and six of the projects that uh, um, managed not to be too heavily impacted by COVID are reporting their um, interim findings through these webinars. Uh, this afternoon, we're very pleased. We have Emily Pringle talking about provisional semantics. Emily's from Tate. And we have Pip Wilcox from the National Archives um, talking about her engaging crowds project. Um, we have some colleagues uh, following us on the live stream. So hello to you if you're out there on YouTube. Um, and for everyone else, it's great to have you. Um, while the presentations are going on, normal format, turn your camera off, you'll automatically be muted. If you want to ask questions, uh, we're going to do that after both presentations. You can put things in the chat as you go along, just in case you forget them later, um, or you can just stick a cue in the chat when we come to the question section and we'll call upon you to um, stick your camera on and ask your question yourself. If anyone's having connection difficulties, feel free to um, just type your uh, question into the chat box. Um, looking to any of my team on the screen, have I covered everything, Carlotta? Yep. Yep. Okie dokie. Then, uh, is it Emily going first? Yes. Okay. Then I will hand over to Emily. Thanks very much, Rebecca. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Can people let me know? Someone stick their thumbs up and tell me if that's, that's good. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. My name is Emily Pringle. I'm the Head of Research at Tate. I'm also the PI on the Provisional Semantics addressing the challenges of representing multiple perspectives within an evolving digitized national collection, a rather wordy title. Um, and I'm representing uh, the research team and I, I am delighted that um, one member of that research team uh, and under Rutherford is part of this seminar as well. She's I've seen her name. So um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Ananda is here and also Kim Polukovitz, who's um, a member of the research team as well. And so I may well call on them, particularly during the Q&A. Um, but I am representing also the colleagues who are um, co-eyes um, Helen Maven, who's at the Imperial War Museum, and Tate Greenhug, who's at the National Trust, and Angela Delisle Clayton, who's at the University of the Arts, London. Um, and I am privileged to represent them. Uh, I feel slightly that I'm uh, speaking on behalf of what is a very group effort. Um, anyway, I will um, uh, crack on. So just to give you some background to the project, initially our, our very um, first thinkings around this project was that we wanted to consider what is, it, we see a fundamental challenge that's uh, facing the tank program broadly. And that is how to develop ethical, equitable and transparent readings of the objects in a digitized national collection. So we started really from that position uh, and then uh, narrowing it down, we really uh, thought and, and began to focus on this, this interrogation of how long-standing problematic racist hierarchies and binaries, narratives and perspectives are produced and reinforced, particularly in relation to catalog entries, object descriptions and interpretive material. So our concern um, really um, started with language and how um, the problematics of the language that's used to describe objects in that, in, that are held by museums and heritage organisations that would, would constitute the national collection, um, we felt needed to, you know, needed to be unpicked and interrogated. Obviously, we're not alone in, in doing this, and I'll come back to um thinking about what how we address the other work that's been done in this area um our aim 
originally uh, was uh, described in terms of, and this is the wording I think that we put in, in the original proposal, was to examine how museums and heritage organizations can develop ethical and equitable and transparent readings of artworks and artifacts, artifacts that include the historically unrepresented perspectives of people of African and Asian descent. However, uh, as the research has developed, we've increasingly come to recognize that this framing is too narrow and the terminology is inadequate. And so um, just at the moment, I would say what is on this screen is really how we are trying to define the aim of the project. And I'd stress the, um, the emphasis on to examine how museums and heritage organizations can develop interpretations, et cetera. I think we come from a place of acknowledging that there's, there is a degree of awareness of what the problem is, <clears throat> but where um, heritage organizations and museums can struggle is actually thinking about what methodologies we need to employ in order to address and change these long-standing problematics. And so really what provisional semantics is doing is testing methodologies of how we how we might address this problem. Uh, I would say that as it is a research project um, that is the more it develops, it's absolutely one of those projects that the more we know the less uh, the more we realize we don't know. And the more we realize the um, scale of the issues that need to be considered in, an, in tackling some of these problems, the challenges. Um, but, but, you know, in times when I think I and the others feel like we are perhaps overwhelmed by the scale of it, one thing we try and come back to is this sense of we are just trying to focus on the how. Um, bearing in mind the complexity of the what. Um, so the methodology that we are adopting is um, what we've what we're calling a practice based action research approach. And um, in part, that's because the researchers, myself included, are practitioners um, rather than kind of academics, in a sense, uh, although you know, that's not to say that our work isn't highly theorized and profoundly thought through, but we are situated in sites of practice in museums and um, heritage organizations, um, except for Anjali, uh, who is based obviously in the university. But I think it's important that, again, this comes back to the question of the how, that we are really looking at um, our own practices uh, in relation to the institutions where we work and the practices of our colleagues. Uh, and we're doing this through looking at three case studies, which I'll come on to in a minute, and looking at, um, at these three overarching and interconnected themes, which I would like to uh, really credit Ananda with, but I'll, I'll speak briefly to what they are. So this one of the themes is content which is very much concerns how material is described, what is privileged and what is erased. Uh, knowledge production, which is exploring um, themes around co-production, intangible heritage, and the ethics of whose knowledge is heard, and particularly thinking about issues, for example, like intellectual property rights. And then thirdly, practice as one of the overarching themes, and this really addresses how organizations uh, control and organize knowledge, data and information, both through their existing systems. So looking, for example, at the limitations of structured data and the perpetuation of particular ontologies through, for example, cataloging practices. And those are being, will, uh, are being explored through, um, there will be some events coming up and also papers written. Uh, and Andrew is involved in develop uh, in a in a deep dive landscape review document. So really looking at kind of what what has been done to date and bringing it together. And then Angeli is leading on um, a, some, a, a, with colleagues a close analysis of particular collection items. 
So just to speak briefly to the three case studies. So the first is the National Trust Clive Collection at Powys Castle. And this is, um, uh, all the case studies are proving to be absolutely fascinating, but perhaps the National Trust case study is the one where it could not, this project could not be more relevant. And in fact, our, the focus of the case study has shifted. And rather than developing a kind of bespoke intervention, what we're doing is really focusing on the what the National Trust are calling their reacted, re reactive rapid response approach um, to addressing uh, in, uh, issues uh, around, for example, the legacies of slavery that they have been adopting from June 2020 onwards when the um, National Trust building started to reopen after the first lockdown. And really what we are looking at and reviewing and Tate Greenhug is leading, leading on this is what happens through particular actions that include work they've done already, for example, around the reinterpretation of paintings, the drafting of labels for collection items and uh, the, the drafting of, a, of different language guides. And um, they are working, um, Tate is working very closely with, with um, both her curatorial colleagues, but also bringing in externals and uh, individuals from across the National Trust to just test different ways of rethinking particular items in the Clive collection. The next case study is based at the Imperial War Museums. And this is really looking at a collection of, of um, photographs um, that were taken by the war, uh, Second World War British official for photographs. And they were catalogued in the 1940s uh, in ways that I think in now acknowledge are, are deeply problematic. Uh, and uh, are also in ways that, that do not contextualize a collection to the public and explore any of the colonial dynamics that are present in the, in the representations. And this case study is examining what happens when different stakeholders are involved in the reinterpretation of that material. So the case study is involving workshops with internal stakeholders, but also with subjects specialists who have expertise of World War II Indian recruits, and also with um, external stakeholders who have um, uh, different forms of expertise. Um, the third case study is at Tate, and this is looking at the Panchayat collection, which is a uh, collection of uh, documentation and reference library material that relates to cultural activities and activism predominantly in Britain, mainland Europe, North America and Southeast Asia that was collected by artists uh, from the 1980s through to the early 2000s. And there are two focuses for this case study, one of which is to uh, explore what happens when you place artists and the originators of the collection right at the heart of its history and foreground their voice in the interpretation and representation of that collection. But in doing so, what, what we're surfacing is, is also um, the limitations of current library practice and cataloging standards. So, so the case study is sort of broadened out to also consider the implications of those on material, uh, on the kind of collecting and also um, how we make accessible material of this kind, which, which doesn't fit easily within existing um, practices. Um, one thing that, that has become incredibly uh, apparent uh, and will prove to be, I think, one of the most significant findings of the project is uh, a recognition that came early to the research team uh, that we are a majority white team with no black researchers and that this is problematic. Uh, and that this, the, the problematics of this became even more urgent uh, as it did, I think, for, for many working cultural organizations in May following just a, a a refocus on, on racism and structural racism within cultural organizations because of what was happening at that time around the 
um, the kind of re reignition of the Black Lives Matter movement. What our response to it, and, and again, I would like to really give credit to Anjali and Ananda who have um, done extraordinary work leading the rest of us through this process, um, has comprised of developing a collaborative process to establish a shared baseline position with regard to the ethics of and for the project and really um, working, all of us working together to uh, interrogate in depth issues around personal racism, structural racism, uh, and the structural racism that, that you know, are, are upheld within the organizations within which we work. And as a result, uh, I think far more than we perhaps realized at the beginning, the research is being framed much more overtly within debate centered on critical race theory and recognizing that the time and energy that we need to give to surface um, and make explicit and communicate how anti-racism and research and positionality must be embedded within uh, not just museum and heritage organization research projects that are overtly dealing with decolonization, for want of a better word, but actually within all research projects. And I think one of the key things that will come out of uh, provisional semantics is, is um, some recommendations on how this work should be embedded. Just to acknowledge uh, that the project has been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, it slowed everything down. We would be much further on in terms of our case studies had, had it not been for the challenges that I think we've been facing. Uh, I won't run through these because you can see them, but it really, um, it, you know, it, some of the things that we'd hoped to do in terms of actually bringing people together with the physical material have not been possible today. But I would say that this slowing down has provided time for us to do this work around research of positionality and to really spend time reading and researching around anti-racism. And I, I am not sure, to be honest, if we would have had the time to do that had we not had this enforced delay. So, so the project, I would argue, has really benefited in some respects from having to slow down. And it makes me um, acutely aware of the importance, again, with all research projects, of building time into the start of a project to do that, that work before rushing straight into uh, all the other stuff that we, we bury ourselves in very quickly. Um, the other point, which is not so much to do with the pandemic, is really um, just to flag that, uh, the issues around what's happening in terms of, of the media and uh, the the media climate that is at times incredibly hostile and this has been particularly apparent to uh, colleagues working in the National Trust but also I think it uh, sort of slightly hangs over all of us in terms of um, just being mindful of what the current climate is both political and in terms of the media in relation to this work. So our interim findings, um, and I, I would say that uh, although the project has been slowed down, we can identify findings, sorry, sorry about the dog, uh, in relation to two objectives. Firstly, to identify the scale of the problem, and secondly, to um, recognize um, what uh, methodologies we think already we can start to advocate for in terms of uh, addressing the issues around um, how to describe and interpret collections and catalogues. So our initial findings, and this perhaps will come as no surprise to those who have been working in this area for some time, is that project work is not a sustainable way of bringing about change. Uh, the change that's needed to produce ethical, equitable and representative digitized national collections. What we find, and this is largely through the desk research, um, but also through our own experience, is that work that has addressed content and language in the name of diversity and inclusion has predominantly taken place on a short term project basis with infrastructure, 
positionality and the context of knowledge production left largely unexamined and unchallenged. So it's much harder through reviewing what's happened already to ascertain whether any of these interventions have resulted in substantial change in cataloging practices or institutional policy development. What we find is that projects are useful for manifesting issues and trialing solutions, but embedded change and meaningful legacy are highly unlikely to be achieved through short-term boundary interventions that occupy a temporary and or marginal space within organizations. Um, so what we find is that change is difficult, is if not impossible, through time and resource limited interventions. What, what needs, uh, what we're increasingly coming to recognize is that changing language and terminology is, is just not enough. Uh, and that we need to uh, really recognize and acknowledge the colonial frameworks um, that, that any kind of catalogs or interpretations or any of these practices exist within. Um, but, um, you know, we, uh, what the desk research has found that there is a, there is a huge amount of work that's been done. And that's not to say that this work isn't of value. It, it's just that it tends to be constrained and that the long-term impacts on the institution are necessarily limited. However, what we do find is that there are the, the, the most recent pressure on heritage and cultural sectors in 2020 is translating into some more sustained shifts in practices and processes. And one issue that the project is likely to address is how the uh, energy and commitment being exhibited can translate and, and what that looks like in terms of, of, of more deep rooted institutional change. Um, one other finding that we have is that there is a uh, urgent need for more resources and detailed practice guidelines to be provided at a national and sector level. So we welcome the um, resources that have recently been produced by the Museums and Library and Archives Association, the MLA, uh, but there is a need for more and a need for sector-wide leadership on this issue. Um, and I think one of our other key findings, and this has really come through that positioning work, is that, uh, and I've touched on this already, establishing an agreed ethical position and set of values is crucial when setting out on any project within museums, uh, espe but especially those addressing a decolonizing agenda. I mean, what we have found, and I think it's probably true for most projects, is that even within a research team that has the same objectives, it cannot be assumed that everyone shares the same experience and perspectives regarding decolonization and anti-racism. And it's vital that understandings are defined and agreed and concepts, not least because concepts of colonization, decolonization and post-colonialism, post -colonialism, sorry about that, are, cont are contested. And also the differences between structural racism, institutional racism and personal prejudice and privilege need to be explored within an environment of trust and care. Explicit and active anti-racism needs to be the baseline you know, for any research project, particularly those addressing decolonization. Furthermore, um, again, that what we would argue for really strongly is that sensitive decolonization work requires ongoing critical reflection individually and through discussion with others with all terms, frames of reference, opinions and traditional behaviors and expectations subject to examination. And what we have uh, acknowledged between ourselves is that um, an approach centered on self-reflexivity is not necessarily something that busy practitioners are familiar and or comfortable undertaking, and it requires support and training. And, and I'd stress again that this work requires continuous attention and application. 
Uh, not least because, uh, as those of us working in museums know, the demands of the job in term in you know anyone working in an organisation, particularly at the moment, coupled with the quite often a return to delivery focused practices, a default back to delivery focused practices, can really derail the necessary critical reflection that's required to do undertake decolonizing work of this kind genuinely and ethically. So time and commitment are absolutely essential if this is if this practice is to be done authentically. Uh, and um, something that we have found again, I think all of us on the research team uh, of to be of huge value and actually uh, more than that to be absolutely essential is the importance and drawing on um, practical resources and reading. Uh, and that, that a practice-based action research approach relies on having the time to do the necessary reading and reflection around. However, what we have found is that not all the material we need is available to museum and heritage colleagues because texts are often paywalled in academic journals that are not accessible to those who don't have a, a university or IRO sponsored access. So again, this sort of speaks to the need for freely available resources. So just to finish up, just to let you know what we're doing next. So um, we're working in relation to each of the case studies. I think we've identified who our critical friends and subject specialists are for each case study uh, and setting up the, the workshops and meetings with those. Um, we will continue with the anti-racism and researcher positionality work right through the project. And we are, uh, Ananda in particular, is refining the research relating to the three overarching strands. And uh, just stress that we will continue to, to explore the potential, whether within the tank program or elsewhere for a centralized resource. Um, what we've done in thus far is in the provisional semantics interim report, which is on the tank website, we have listed all the texts that we've read and all the uh, events that we've attended with links uh, wherever possible. So in a way, trying to start um, to share some of the resources that, that we've gathered um, with a view to thinking about what, how those might inform a centralized resource. So I think that's me done. Thank you very much, Emily, given everyone a huge amount to think about. Uh, we'd be delighted if any of your um, research team want to chip in on the questions later, absolutely. Um, okay, we will move on to our second presentation. Um, Pip, over to you. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Could you give me a nod or a thumbs up if you can see the screen? Oh, thanks, Emily. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rebecca, Colin, um, all the team for organising this. And thanks to everyone for coming today, too. I've really enjoyed how our foundation projects are um, finding out how they're going over these, these um, webinars. So thank you very much for all of them. And I'm delighted to be sharing our progress on the Engaging Crowds project with you today and let you know where we're headed next. And my clicker isn't working, sorry. Is that working? Okay. Thank you, Colin. Sorry, you'd think we'd learn, but it seems different every time. Um, our knowledge infrastructure is a living, growing organism in delicate equilibrium and occasionally an imbalance. Uh, it's not only capable of adaptation, change is its life force. And from the inside, our eyes are often drawn to its various parts, um, collections, publishing, research, experimentation, design, funding opportunities. It's a very long list. But once we step outside and look at it in its entirety, perhaps the most notable thing is the people, the researchers, the scholars, scientists, curators, librarians, archivists, technicians, research software engineers, experts of, of all stripes, many more than, than these, um, and the many audiences that, um, for the work that they do. And we might also note that these groups, the experts and the audiences are not mutually exclusive and 
quite the opposite. They often overlap and people play different roles at different times or they merge coming together as, as co-creators. Certainly this is the case in our national collection where the public is a vital part of its co-creation. Indeed, engaging with this broad, groups, um, it, this broad group is one of the pillars of, of Towards a National Collection, as many or perhaps all of you will know. We've learnt these pillars by heart by now, or have them inscribed on our hearts. Uh, so you'll be relieved that I won't be reading them out loud, but they're there as a reminder. And thank you, Colin, for these beautiful images that I took from your website. Um, an area of focus for us at the National Archives, as in so many other heritage organisations, is public participation. And this is where our foundation project, Engaging Crowds, sits. There's a, um, a long, long history of crowdsourcing. It's been with us for centuries. Um, often when I'm talking about it, I point to Sally Shuttleworth's work at Oxford on uh, 19th century citizen science to illustrate this, or the reading programme that co-created the Oxford English Dictionary. But just last week, I attended a, a brilliant seminar by Marta Severo from the Université Paris-Nanterre. She was talking as part of the seminar series run by the Venice Centre for Digital and Public Humanities on cultural heritage, participation and platforms, theoretical and methodological challenges. In an exciting and inspiring talk, among many other ideas, she pointed to the 16th century as an identifiable point when the public, albeit a particular privileged subsection of the public, started to engage in scholarship and heritage, including through grand tours. This voluntary engagement in heritage, in research and scholarship more broadly continues today and it produces excellent work. Lots of this happens in person, or, or perhaps I should say it did, um, and we hope it will do again one day. But a step change came a couple of decades ago with the wide uptake of digital technologies and particularly the broadening access to the web. People with an interest in heritage adopted digital and increasingly web-based tools to share their stories, their, their histories and their heritage. This extensive online engagement has enabled people to gather and record collections in a form of citizen heritage that has created a truly democratic and vast reservoir of new knowledge about the past. We were just hearing from Emily about the brilliant and important work of the Provisional Semantics Project, bringing multiple perspectives to bear on our national collection and ensuring that it includes voices that have traditionally been missing, ignored or suppressed. At the National Archives, our collections are the record of government and an important part of our work provides additional context for them, focusing on individual or collective lives and stories within those records and accessible digital technologies provide um, a raft of means for making these links and surfacing these voices. Part of Marta Severo's research looks at where in the digital world people choose to gather and share their histories, their voluntary work that creates, analyzes or annotates collections and their responses to these. Severo demonstrated that these encounters often happen through where people are, predominantly on social media. And she draws a distinction which she shows is complementary with sites set up specifically for these purposes. They ask people to come to them to give their time and share their knowledge on what she calls institutional sites. But whether formalized or self-organized or entirely organic, this digitally enabled participation happens now at a size, scale and speed unachievable before the web, and perhaps unimaginable in the 16th century. And this is where we focused our thinking as we considered the opportunity of Towards a National Collection. The potential for reaching audiences and engaging them as active participants in any number of research and heritage endeavors is huge and merits more study to understand and improve it. There are many platforms for this digitally enabled participation. Some are developed in-house to answer particular purposes. This one, for example, is from the Royal Society's Making Science um, resource. And it's a fantastic example. Thanks to Louisiane Fellier for sharing um, the work that she and her colleagues are doing on this at the Royal Society. So this is a site where people are invited on, on one platform to search, browse and transcribe, translate and, and feed back. Um, on the collection that one they're working on in particular um, are the records of the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, the 350 year old and some um, academic publication. And a different model for this kind of engagement is Zooniverse. For anyone who doesn't know, Zooniverse is a platform for people powered research, as they say. Um, it's the, large, the world's largest and most popular platform of its type. And you can see the amount of activity from this slide. These are numbers that I captured yesterday. 
It's based at the University of Oxford and the Adler Planetarium in the United States. And its goal is to enable research that would not be possible or practical um, otherwise. Their belief is that at Zooniverse, anyone can be a researcher and contribute to real academic research on their own computer or their phone um, and at their own convenience. Naturally, this applies to enriching heritage projects too. So when we were considering a project that explored this area, we discussed the possibility of a collaborative project with Chris, Sam and Grant from the Zooniverse and were thrilled they saw potential for work we could undertake together. And at the same time, we were chatting with colleagues at other independent research organisations and found two enthusiastic partners we're delighted to be working with, Elspeth and Sally from the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh and Martin and Stuart from the Royal Museum's Greenwich, the, the National Maritime Museum in, in particular. It's a lovely group of people to be working with, and I'd like to record my thanks to them for all the work on the project, as well as contributing to slides for, for this talk. And so the team was assembled. We um, agreed the overall aims for our project, that we wanted to understand the current state of citizen research in heritage organisations and heritage more broadly, um, to explore how to improve the volunteer experience through a well-defined intervention in the ecosystem by creating a, a prototype indexing tool that would enable people to navigate their way around a collection online um, while, while volunteering. We wanted to explore the, the barriers and identify solutions for the effective use and reuse of, of data produced by citizen volunteers, citizen researchers, and make recommendations to inform policy for the development of a future national and indeed supranational national, because it's on the web, uh, citizen heritage effort. Specifically, each of the heritage partners uh, would run a citizen research project in which we would use this prototype navigation tool developed by Zooniverse. We will run three workshops to consult the wider community on the current and potential uses of citizen research in heritage, the ethics, motivations and practicalities of this type of work, and the reuse of volunteer created data by three audiences we identified. Um, I'll speak a little more of those later. In addition, we would analyze three sources of data. Um, so responses from heritage groups and organizations. So if you've been in touch with citizen research yourself um, and you haven't already, please do get in touch. I'll give you details towards the end. Um, we are looking at qualitative uh, data from volunteers engaged in our citizen research work um, and quantitative data from, from the usage statistics um, that we're also able to, uh, to access on the Zoom, from behind the Zooniverse platform. And because we were running three projects within the umbrella Engaging Crowds project and needed time to finalize findings from that work, our project had the maximum allowable duration of, of 24 months. We were fortunate enough not to be too affected um, by the pandemic in the early stages of our project. Uh, we moved our work around, um, uh, around obstacles as they arose, but recently we've been directly affected by it uh, beyond what our contingency planning has been able to absorb. So we will be asking for an extension to this project too of, of three months. But so on to the details of the project. So, Zooniverse has its roots um, in, well, in, in astrophysics specifically, but in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Um, and it means that traditionally the, the subjects, as they call them, um, that they deliver to volunteers. So these are individual pieces of data, for example, images. Um, increasingly, they work with other forms of data on their, on their platform, um, including audio, for example. Um, but they deliver these at random to volunteers. It doesn't matter what order you look at pictures of the universe in if you're looking out for particular features. But um, recent work that they've done to research, support and build new tools and resources for, um, for the heritage sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums, um, and for humanities professionals and researchers using their platform, um, have led them to interrogate how elements of the underlying Zooniverse methodology and structure may not be useful across genres universally including in particular randomized presentation of, of these subjects. So in other words, some people want to choose what order they see images in and it's more important depending on what sort of project you're looking at. So what Zooniverse is doing in the project, uh, in our project Engaging Crowds, is designing and building an indexing tool, this prototype tool that I mentioned earlier, which will be used across all three of our citizen research projects. This will give volunteers greater agency in choosing what materials they want to work on within, a crowd, within one crowdsourcing project. It's based on available metadata provided by, um, by each of our organizations. 
um, and in it to enable that navigation. We can envisage a time when it might be available across projects on Zooniverse um, or perhaps even beyond, but that, um, that sort of function is well beyond the scope of our project and its prototyping tool. The tool itself will be, um, once it's uh, ready and up and running, will be freely available for anyone to use um, through the Zooniverse Project Builder tool, uh, which is a free resource for anyone to make a citizen research project of their own. Um, and the code is on GitHub. Our Zooniverse colleagues are also working with our citizen research project teams individually to help guide us through the process of building an effective crowdsourcing project with the goal of um, the right tool choice um, to produce useful and high quality results for researchers um, and a positive experience for volunteers that uses their time efficiently and, and gives the collection holding organisations data that's useful to them. They're using feedback from researchers um, and volunteer uh, testers to iterate on the designs um, for the projects as they launch in, in turn. And so on to the three citizen research projects we're running as part of our project. Um, so first up is Royal Museums Greenwich, um, working on HMS NHS, the Nautical Health Service. So colleagues at, um, at Royal Museum Greenwich's Cared Library, um, Cared Library and Archive, sorry. Um, their staff were looking for a flexible um, transcription tool to allow volunteers to transcribe a diverse range of archive material, um, government records, business records, or unstructured personal correspondence and diaries. Martin um, at RNG, what Museums Greenwich, and his colleagues um, chose the records of the Dreadnought Seamen's Hospital, a hospital for merchant seamen, which existed in Greenwich um, between 1826 and 1930. These have been digitised on Ancestry.com, but only a small part of the data are searchable. Um, and Martin and his colleagues were keen to make the entirety of the records available digitally to offer researchers the chance to analyse the records, to see what trends and patterns are, evidence, are evident in over 100 years worth of data and a large number of 19th and early 20th century case studies in the history of medicine. Martin's worked with our Zooniverse colleagues, um, Sam and Grant, to design a pathway through records that are for the volunteers to take. And workflows um, is what we call these workflows of the sets of tasks that volunteers um, complete uh, for each record. Um, record might be a word that we would use, subject is what it's called in, in Zooniverse terminology. But these, with the prototype tool, mean that volunteers can choose, for example, to make progress quickly and transcribe columns for speed, um, or they can transcribe individual, um, uh, or they can transcribe whole pages you know, going right across the page. Um, the second might be better if you want greater immersion in the records, you can follow the human interest stories through them. The, the first, doing a column at a time, might be easier if you're just um, setting out, particularly if you're getting used to the handwriting, for example. Following in-house testing, um, with the help of a super volunteer of theirs called Trevor, um, HMS NHS is currently in pre-launch testing by the Zooniverse community, so beta testing now. Volunteers um, will complete a, a rigorous feedback form, um, and here it is, so the, the form they're asked to fill in, which will show us um, how to iterate the project design. And each of the projects, um, each of the three projects in turn, will go on um, to vet these various stages of testing, internal and then testing across the project, and then the beta testing um, with, with volunteers on Zooniverse before they're, before they're live. So Martin and um, colleagues at the Royal Museums Greenwich plan to train archive staff um, to use the Zooniverse project builder themselves to recruit their own volunteers and develop their own transcription and indexing projects. These will be turned into the cataloguing process for selected projects, providing, for example, material for exhibitions or targeting specific documents within large uncatalogued collections um, or identifying research priorities in, in new acquisitions. And so on to the project based at the National Archives with us, um, with thanks to Bernard, who's leading on this work, and to Thomasina, an undergraduate placement student who was with us this summer and fed into these design discussions. Will Butler is our um, record specialist who's um, also putting lots of work into this, um, including uh, giving us something that he calls Will's history lesson. So that we're all up to speed on, on these particular records. The rest of us are not expert in these, but it was identified as a, 
um, a really rich area um, that's uh, to, to explore. Um, the, the collection we're working on um, is the minute books of the Royal Hospital Chelsea, so better known as the place where the Chelsea pensioners lived. Um, and it's the minute books from the period of the First World War. So this was a time when many women were working there. Um, it was a time of great change administratively. Uh, pensions used to be handed out uh, by the two Royal Hospitals, one in Dublin and, and one um, in London to, to veterans. And these were shifting to the war office, so shifting to central government. And there are, minute books sound quite dry, but there are wonderful details in them of, of daily life at the hospitals, of, of the people, um, of shopping lists, medicines, whiskey allocations, and prosthetic limbs, just all sorts. And the um, data um, within them are um, in include uh, both sort of indexing, so index books that link um, names and topics, and then uh, minute books, which include the structured agenda items within the minutes. So onto the substance of these rich data. Um, they are only fairly structured. Um, it, they look as though they might be much more so, but they are not entirely. Um, so it's not always easy to understand them by glancing at them, what, what um, refers to what, or to be able to follow um, an agenda item through to see what, what conclusion was reached and what effect that had on life at the hospital. Um, so particular things that, uh, that pose challenges for designing our workflows um, include things that are very easy for the human eye to look at and understand, but much harder to put into um, computational workflows. So they um, are, for example, the curly brackets and arrows in the image on the top left, uh, squiggles like the one in the um, bottom left image, and tabular information in the minutes, and um, that's on, on the right hand. So we've asked volunteers to capture the information um, there rather than exactly transcribe what's on the page, but to be as exact as possible within it. So for example, replicating spelling errors and not expanding abbreviations. This will enable us to use the data that they produce um, as well as to enrich our catalog, but also to experiment with, um, hand, uh, with, with HDR, so handwritten um, handwriting recognition software um, for pages where we don't have tables and complicated squiggles that the software cannot cope with at all. We've got three workflows, one for the index pages, one for the minutes pages, and one for underlining. And this will um, help us enormously when we come to test it against um, training uh, automated handwriting recognition. We are entering beta soon, which will give us some initial insight um, into the workflows and allow us to make a final decision about whether to include the underlining workflow in the final project, or if that's just a faff that volunteers are not, not interested in doing and don't feel it's a good use of their time. On then to our final uh, of these three citizen research projects at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. Um, so Elspeth and Sally there are developing two projects because um, they're just brilliant, um, a baseline project and an indexed project using this navigation tool. So they're splitting up their um, digital specimen images of the plant family Gesneriaceae. Um, into two randomized data sets and the Gesneriaceae family, I've learned how to say it so I'm going to say it as often as I can, um, it's a family of plants um, that grows around the world in the tropics and is perhaps most familiar to us um, through the African violet. So these specimens are minimally um, databased and, and imaged um, at, at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh Volunteers are invited to transcribe the specimen label data um, in order to make the digital specimens research ready uh, for the, the international community that, that works with or wants to work with them. It facilitates research into global biodiversity by releasing this data that's held in 300 years worth of plant specimens and, and the handwritten records about them. Um, Elspeth and Sally are currently finalizing the baseline project, building on the experience um, that they have already with and they have institutionally with other crowdsourcing projects. Um, they will be using drop down menus as part of their workflow, um, using controlled vocabularies for volunteers to pick from. It can, um, it's a different experience for volunteers of picking from drop down menus as opposed to transcribing. It definitely increases the accuracy of data as the universe have good, good um, evidence for that. It may be some people may enjoy it less. Um, it also means it's much easier to do, for example, on a, on a bus, on your phone or, or tablet, um, rather than perhaps wanting a keyboard for, um, for, for some of the other types, for example, longhand transcription. 
Um, they're also incorporating current work on international digitization standards for natural science collections, such as the minimum information about a digital specimen, that's their MIDS, M-I-D-S um, uh, standard. And in their second project, so this is the indexed one using the navigation tool, um, they plan to facilitate a wide range of indexing options using the information from processing their um, digital specimen images through optical character recognition software. So this is OCR that I think many of us are, are familiar with. Um, this already forms part of their standard digitization work um, and its data will be used to provide categories of specimens for uh, volunteers to select. They've carried out um, data entry tests comparing the time taken to enter data um, from random as against pre-sorted specimen records and found that the most efficient workflow was the one that was based on partial data entry so working with specimens which had already been filtered by collector and country. As with all three uh, citizen research projects we're looking to develop best practices um, for using citizen research projects to promote the existence of um, and access to collections, methods of quality control and, anal and analysis of the resulting data um, to ensure that the results can be used and reused effectively. That bit comes from our uh, application for the project. Um, and this is from respect, as we said earlier, as I said earlier, for the, um, for the time that our volunteers are generously donating to us um, to make best use of that time and also ensure that the data that they produce is, is useful um, to the collections holding organizations as well, to, um, to the three IROs. Sorry, I flipped slide too early there. Um, so our Zooniverse colleagues have also, of course, been very busy. They have consulted with all three uh, project teams to understand the individual project goals. Um, they've created designs and user stories for the indexing tool um, and built underlying technical infrastructure to support it. Um, they've already worked um, to get uh, Martin's project, HMS NHS um, at Royal Museums Greenwich to its beta testing. Um, and uh, this, for them, this navigation tool will allow people to choose, volunteers to choose um, either a workflow type or a subject, so a particular image um, that they want to work on a particular page. They are finishing up development work on the infrastructure, uh, which will allow for individual subject selection um, and which will be used in the next two projects. So this includes the ability to choose which, which page of which record to work on. So for example, you could jump between um, index books in, in the National Archives project um, and, the, um, uh, and, and the minutes that are described within the, uh, that keep the, the details um, of, of the meetings that they were held and decisions that, that were made. Um, and uh, creating, the Zooniverse are also creating a data infrastructure that allows certain metadata fields to be included in the individual subject so that the navigation tool will, will work um, and this is what it will look like you can choose what sort of uh, workflow you'd like to follow as a volunteer so I mentioned earlier that we're also investigating the audiences for heritage data produced by uh, volunteers. To explore this, we're holding one workshop for each of the broad audiences we've identified. So the machines themselves, um, people working alongside automation, um, and we're moving to a point where machines will check people's work as, as well as people checking machines um, work, for example, as in the um, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh project where uh, people will be um, using OCR data and checking it um, as part of that. Uh, we held that um, shortly before the formal start of the, of the project, uh, which was slightly, the start was slightly delayed, um, which is why we got our workshop in first. Uh, then a year later, we held, um, the first one was in person as well. Do you remember that? It's December, 2019. I, um, Time seems quite distant now. Uh, the second workshop was held this December, hosted um, in Edinburgh, but uh, virtual, of course. Um, and that was getting the perspective of the collection holding, um, collections holding organisations, making sure or understanding what barriers there are and what opportunities there are for them to use um, volunteer produced data. And the, uh, the third workshop um, will look at the volunteer, the, the citizen researcher perspective. Um, whether they can access, whether they want to access, um, and whether they have um, the right skills to make use of um, the data that they themselves, you know, we, the public, have, have produced. So I'll say a very brief word about, um, about something related to this project that isn't part of it. We feel in our project in engaging crowds that it's, this is important work in its own right, 
Um, and it also feeds into other work that's ongoing across our organizations. We're all individually as organizations um, invested in, um, in this kind of citizen engagement, citizen research. So for example, at the National Archives, uh, we have a research fellow in advanced digital methods funded uh, generously by the Friends of the National Archive. Um, her name is Andrea Coxis, and she's working on data produced in this previous citizen research project, Operation War Diary. So um, Operation War Diary was a collaboration between the Imperial War Museum and the National Archives us, and Zooniverse again, um, to tag and classify the daily diaries of all British Army infantry units on the Western Front. Um, 1914 to, to 1918, so um, the same period uh, that we're working on um, with the, the records of the Royal Hospital Chelsea. Um, this is, it's really rich data that many people are interested in because it includes a lot of names um, that are, don't otherwise necessarily make it into the historical record. So lots of family historians are very interested in this. Um, and the crowdsourcing project, the citizen research project, um, asks people to tag as well as transcribe um, bits of the parts of the records. Um, and the, you know, the overarching aim was to unlock this, this data, this um, fascinating data, and inspire new audiences to interact with our collection um, in new and unexpected ways, Andrea says. Um, so this crowdsourcing um, was undertaken by over 16,000 users, um, 16,000 volunteers on, on Zooniverse, and we're really um, uh, grateful to them, of course, um, and also looking forward to making this data um, accessible in every sense of the word. Um, you fun to browse um, as well as available online. So you've heard from Emily about the challenges the pandemic has brought on on all our projects actually. As I said we, we were lucky enough not to be so badly affected early on but it's, it's come to bite us in, in recent months and we're also very aware of, of the general state of both the university and the cultural heritage sector sectors. Um, as for example, we are uh, we're asking for help or for participation in workshops at a time when people are really thinly stretched. On the upside, however, you know, looking for silver linings is what we do. Um, there are lots of people throwing themselves into online citizen research, and there's um, there's good data emerging, not on our projects, which aren't live yet, but on other projects, um, to suggest that people are, are volunteering even more of their time into these sort of projects where um, you know, where, where they're doing worthwhile things. Um, so yeah, this, we hope they feel they're doing worthwhile things. They're certainly doing a lot more of it. Um, and finding out whether they think they're doing worthwhile things is part of our project um, and something we'll explore um, through surveys, but also through the final, the final workshop that we'll be running in autumn this year. Um, another of our challenges um, is work uh, that relates to something Carlotta is leading on um, in towards a national collection, and that's around licensing um, and, and access. And the challenge this presents to projects that join um, digital cultural heritage resources um, in respect to ethics and the law and the expectations and aspirations of people who want to use them. It's fantastic having Carlotta and her expertise um, looking at this from a central point of view because it's something that um, as we're serious about creating a, a national collection that we, um, that we need to crack. So our next steps. Um, are that the citizen research projects will go live in sequence as, as planned, a little later than planned, um, but they will go live. Um, we're going to survey um, participants in them um, and gain qualitative data, we hope, on, on engagement on their motivation um, from that survey. We'll also be analysing the quantitative data um, from looking at usage statistics um, on, from Zooniverse. We're going to report back to our brilliant advisory board that we're really um, lucky to, to have helping us. Um, and we have a, the final um, the, the final workshop that I mentioned. I said that we were looking for um, information about other people's heritage based um, crowdsourcing system research projects, particularly digitally um, digitally enabled ones. If you have anything that you'd be happy to share us internal reports or blog posts, um, as well, obviously, as, as published and peer reviewed things, do send us any information you have. We'll be enormously grateful for all of it. We can respect confidentiality if that's needed, of course, um, but would be very grateful. So please um, do send things our way if you have anything to send. Um, and finally, thanks again to um, the, um, the brilliant project team um, and to our wider institutional colleagues across the and colleagues right across the foundation projects 
Um, and also to our friends at the Royal Hospital Chelsea, who've been hugely sh generous uh, sharing images with us with, with, for our um, Scarlets and Blues project, as, as we're calling it. Um, spoiler alert, we haven't launched it yet. Named after the, um, the names of the uniforms that the pensioners at the Royal Hospital Chelsea, um, they wear Scarlets and Blues. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope Rebecca has prizes for anyone who's made it through all six of these talks. And having set her up like that, I shall hand back to her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pip. That was absolutely fascinating and good luck for when the projects go live. I do actually have at my desk some little uh, chocolate Easter eggs, um, but I've counted how many people have been to all three and I'm eating their eggs for them. So, you know, it's just a public service. So um, we're going to open now for questions. As I say, the easiest thing you can do is use the chat box and put a Q in if you've got a question. If you want to make a more general comment, feel free to put a C in, but just indicate that you want to speak and um, we will call upon you. Um, let me just make sure I can see the chat box, that would help. Um, oh, we have a, an enigmatic person first, SVO. <laughs> Please declare yourself. Okay, we got a question in the chat from the identity is simply SVO. Aha, Sarah Ogilvy. Sarah, do you want to um, turn on your camera and mic and ask your question? Are you with us, Sarah? I am. I am. Can you hear me? I can. You're hiding behind my chat box, but there we go. Please go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Emily and uh, Pip. They, they were terrific talks. Pip, I wondered if you could give us a sense of the size of, of each of those projects, um, like how many records or sub subjects will there be for people to... Um, engage with and try and help with the tasks. Thank you. Hi Sarah, it's lovely to see you. Um, I really should know that, shouldn't I? I can tell you for the National Archives one and I can't remember for the other two. I could find out and get back to you. Um, it's a, a small um, data set that we have deliberately chosen for the, for the National Archives. Um, so it's um, about 550 odd. Um, images. We deliberately chose something that was um, quite small because um, so that we could get so, so that we could complete it and it would be um, really useful. Uh, we, we are we are hopeful so one can't take volunteers um, ge generously donating their time for granted but we're hopeful that we'll be able to get it completed um, and then it can feed into our catalogue and hugely en enrich that part of it. Um, it's, it is a small, um, it, it's a small collection, but it's enormously rich in names. And it's particularly interesting to us um, at the National Archives and we hope to other people as well, because um, as many of you will know, the 1921 census will be released in January, uh, January 2022. Um, so we'll be able to trace the names uh, through that. So that's why we chose that, that small, um, small project. Uh, the Royal Museum's Greenwich um, collection is also not vast, um, I think. Uh, certainly that was the conversation that we had that they're using a subset of those log books. Um, and uh, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh have a much bigger collection that they're working with. And it's one of the reasons that they're able to split their project in two. So we have a comparator um, with, within the project. I mean, the whole, all the projects are going to be compared to um, uh, to others on Zooniverse, but, but they've got their comparator built in. Um, so sorry, I don't have the numbers. Uh, but I, I can find out for you. And I wonder whether, just looking at the chat, that this speaks also to the question that's come from Matthew Bridson. Um, I am hugely tempted to call on Ananda to uh, answer this, but actually I noticed that there's a question below this, which is particularly around addressing the limitations of cataloguing, which I absolutely have to look to you, Ananda, to answer. So shall I have a crack at answering this one? And then maybe you can move on to the other one. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think uh, we have an easy uh, or a kind of neat answer to this. And I think what we are discovering is um, 
is we really need to try things out and in in the true spirit of action research kind of try things see whether things work or what the impact is on us and the project and then re, um, refine as we go but I think one of the most significant uh, interventions has been um, the mandatory ask uh, of each person in the research team to do a personal positioning statement. And this is something that, um, again, and Andrew and Angeli very generously provided a, a set of prompt questions for each one of us um, to, to write our own experiences and reflections on ourselves, our families, our experiences of racism, what we felt we brought to the project in terms of our professional experience, our personal experience. Um, and each one of us has written these statements and um, we have shared them amongst each other and had a discussion around them. And uh, alongside the writing of that has been um, mandatory reading. And I think the mandatory is something that is really important. Uh, and I think this is where institutional um, leadership really is required. I mean, we are a small research team, so it's relatively easy and we are all committed, uh, you know, deeply committed to this work. But I think without, um, you know, most of the organizations we work within, certainly my own institution is very hierarchical uh, so uh, what, le what leadership models and manifests is, is very significant in relation to this. Um, and I think what working on this project has really prompted me to reflect on is the extent to which um, uh, enabling or, or more than enabling staff to engage with uh, anti-racist readings, anti-racist discourse, anti-racist practices has to be a kind of fundamental requirement for anybody working within an institution. It, it should be a kind of non-negotiable, um, almost in terms of, of um, you know, if you're recruited with a certain expertise, say in curatorial practice, you also have to have expert, you know, or be aware of what what ethical anti-racist practice is as well. Um, and I know that's a big ask, but um, I think that's what this project has taught me. And Anne, did you want to add something? If it that's okay and there's time Rebecca I just wanted to say to Wendy in a in a sort of um world where the telegraph is calling these things sort of leftist indoctrination there is no when we say mandatory it's actually about establishing shared values and I I for one don't think that there's an opposite to you know you are racist or you're anti-racist it's not really in the BBC way of um getting balance on this issue so these are ethical sort of ideas that need to be reinserted and and sort of made um front and central when we're thinking until it's much more pervasive in 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 the way we approach the subject matters and humans um in in the work we do because we are in cultural heritage instruments of you know, colonial damage and the perpetuation of colonial era ideas, it, it right down to our sort of, you know, um, I want to say boot, boot nails or something, but right down to our toenails. Um, and, and I think that recognising that and trying to unpick it actively is, is really important and has actually become not urgent, not just because of last year, but urgent in a circumstance where we're being edited. And it's not like it hasn't been there before. There's a cycle of recognition and erasure that goes on. Um, so, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'll stop. No, no problem, thank you. Jen, do you want to put your mic on and ask your question directly? I forgot I had that bit. Hi. Um, yeah, this is one for um, Emily and Ananda and the Provisional Semantics team. Um, you mentioned, in, Emily mentioned encountering some limitations of cataloging um, when trying to center artists and originators as part of the Tate case study. Um, and Ananda, I was wondering if you could say maybe a little bit more about what kinds of limitations you're facing in trying to do that. 
yeah um um emily oh i'm muted have i muted no, no. You're not. sorry the incompetency um there's there's a lot there there's a lot of barriers there are limitations with structured data there are limitations with terminologies we use you know if you if you go to sector standards like aat and trace down the words are problematic people are not sure what actual preferred terms are appropriate terms are historic terms there are anxieties about erasure um, and there's a fair bit of that going on um, of cleaning up um, data cleaning is problematic for any level of interrogation of um, critical, critical interpretation of, of cataloging. I think there are also things on the macro level when we put things in the archive or the museum as collection or the library, there's a whole load of things that go on in terms of the information captured. Um, and so you can, you can kill a collection of objects by putting them in a, institutionally you can do this by putting them in a particular silo and I think we're still very siloed so some of those barriers need unpicking so how you deal with with collections that do not conform to conceptualizations of what an archive is or what a library collection is or what a special collection is or what an object artifact is, are a lot of the problems it, with that and, and there's a lack of knowledge about how you might address that. So we identified the three themes which are content which I think often gets a, you know what subject matter what languages are used. There are a lot of projects historically on that engaging with that um, and trying to unpick it. There's also the second thing which is knowledge production which is how not to be extractive and also, um, you know, inflicting authority. So all of these things are about power dynamics of knowledge production and they intersect. And the last one also is about actual practices, you know, the way in which you enter data, um, how you employ the guidelines, you know, how you, how you, the ontological aspects, how you describe the world. Um, and we have a sort of habitual practice in cataloging of pretending to be neutral on ob objective without actually looking at the the history of how we catalog and where that information comes from it's a particular way of capturing the world and we replicate it daily um, in curatorial and collections work unthinkingly and also under the guise of neutrality and I think this is um, further kind of codified when we're in through digital remediation so those are the barriers and breaking that down and getting people to see it I mean fundamentally for me a lot of this sits within critical cataloging so a much broader way of, of looking at what we do why we do it, the historiography of the catalog records but also how we interact ethically IPR and I didn't catch from um, Pip who was working in Carlotta you said we're looking at something very similar about how things like RPR museum authority access and control you know we have a habit very often in cultural heritage institutions of asking people volunteers academics lived experience you know to serve our need as we've actually articulated it when I actually think we need to flip more into looking at people doing what they want to do with what we have and then learning from that. So it's about addressing all those sort of behavioral barriers, institutional fear and brand, you know, about saying the wrong thing, which are all very, very layered, but also structurally embedded. Does that, I don't know whether that answers your question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to turn to Carlotta, our loyal viewers will know that Carlotta uh, Paltronieri is our uh, researcher on the tank team. Um, she can say some comments uh, later on, on the uh, research she's commissioning on copyright. But for the moment, Carlotta, do you have a question for either of the speakers? Yes, I mean, it's still uh, around decolonization, um, but for PIP. And I wanted to ask if uh, in your experience, uh, participatory methods and citizen science has played a role in, in decolonization or if could, it could play a role? Oh, thanks, Carlotta. That's a, a fantastic question and one that's very much in our minds, um, particularly as we've been thinking um, about the, the next stage of projects for Tank, the discovery project. Yes, absolutely, it, um, it, it could and does um, in many cases. When it comes to, um, I, I think it's useful, um, the reason I touched on it um, earlier on, um, I think it might be useful to, to consider how the infrastructure enables that or disables it. Um, and Marta Severo's um, talk uh, that, that highlighted the difference between what people choose to do when they, um, when they, as it were, make up their own rules, as opposed to what institutional sites um, 
enable people to do might have uh, has some bearing on that because obviously people are writing both writing about everything in the world that interests them but uh, of, of particular interest to us might be the heritage and the culture um, and they'll make groups on Facebook or chat on Twitter or Insta or you know, wherever else they are and they're they're meeting like-minded people with similar interests or you know with something in common um, and that is a place where people might share things um, using language so for example dialect or um or other languages other languages from the um the the official language of, of the place that they live for example they'll be using technical terms jargon if they're talking about the history of their own industry perhaps um so there are places where people can talk in uh ways that they uh, in the ways they choose the ways that are appropriate to them um and um there are and then there are the institutions that we know well who have very structured catalogues that Emily and Ananda and their colleagues can talk more to this than, than me, but the catalogues are the infrastructure that reflect the, the dominant mindset of the day. For example, at the National Archives, we have the record of government, so our records are, um, are arranged by government department. It, you know, it, it couldn't be more top down than, than that. Um, so it depends. <laughs> We, we could create projects that enabled it and or um, work that that looked obviously with respect and permission um, at collections that other people had um, had assembled. Um, or we can say, could you do these very precise tasks? So the Zooniverse platform is um, much more suited to could you do these very precise tasks? And the um, a lot of the work that goes in behind the scenes is into making sure that those tasks don't ask people to do things that aren't useful, and that the tasks that they do then feed directly into what it is you're trying to do. So, um, for example, in in our cases, amongst other things, it's enriching catalogue records. Um, so it's our job to you know, to link up the additional information that we've got. But other projects take different approaches and say, tell us anything you know about your family in the First World War, for, for example. So I'm, my, my head's in that period at the moment. Um, that would be a different style of project. So within our immediate foundation project, no. Um, but more broadly, yes, absolutely. And that's why it's such an important way of, of engaging with, um, with communities and bring them in, you know, acknowledging them as they are part of the national collection and linking them up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pip. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? All I need is a cue in the chat. You don't need to write out your question. Anybody want to come in? And anybody on the live stream can record it there and Colin will translate it over for us. Rebecca, perhaps in the meantime, I can ask a sort of follow up question to Emily, uh, meaning that um, Emily or the team, how, what role does technology play in, in this? So you mentioned this centralized resource, so perhaps you could talk a little bit more about um, how will technology help your project in this in specific, specifically, but also in general, um, the cause, how, how can it advance and, and help in, in decolonization? Do you want me to? Okay. <laughs> Um, I think, again, it's criticality. Um, so particularly looking at cataloguing and interpretation object description going out online in online collections, which of course is what Tank is, that we're trying to actually address the practices of that before through remediation it becomes fixed and therefore fixed and then distributed as a contribution to the understanding of the world um, or the, I think Rupika Rissan calls it the, the digital cultural record, which is what we're all doing here. So actually, we although we're using technology and it's very odd not to be get to get near the objects, and that's been very, that's been quite tough actually, when a lot of this is response work to actually engaging with 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 uh, be it archival um, material or artifacts, it's actually um, sort of one of the things that's missing for us. But um, it's to actually try and rebalance that record um, so that it's not constantly a sort of one note thing, which it isn't. And I you know, fully accept there's a whole variety of information out there. But increasingly, there's a sort of staticness. Um, and there's also a lack of data. One of the other findings that we haven't got quite got to articulating is that you can't find stuff because it simply hasn't been written or published. There are languishing collections and stuff. And that's another one of our barriers. You know, if you let a collection languish, you actually 
hold a place for it, but you also provide a barrier and a gap in some ways about um, knowledge if you only sort of put things online at inventory level. So I think addressing things like, I mean, the rest of the projects are doing this connectivity and access. But I think one of the other things for us is actually to unpick with the knowledge production, what access means as well. You know, is it truly accessible? Who is actually engaging with it? So in some ways the project is quite reflective of the sector and also of practices of very specific things, how we write and engage with objects, but that should be improve how we serve and send out information in a more democratic and ethically broad way. So if you put the language out there, the bots pick up the language, you know, and we, we improve that. That's my very, very sophisticated technical analysis there. And I realize who's in the room, so I'm going to die of embarrassment, but I can't find a way to say it more clearly. But what you put out, could disrupt what's already out there and improve the, the search, the retrieval and all of those kinds of things. So, so I think ours is a, more of a sort of um, a, a channeling out of all sorts of knowledge and experience and to make that as broad, as ethical, as anti-racist as possible to counter possible narratives that are coming very strongly in the other direction. Does that answer? I don't... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got Alison Day next, who has very cleverly managed to incorporate the themes of both uh, presentations into one question. Do you want to address it, Alison? Hello. Yes, um, I realised that I kind of overlapped just as you were saying, um, saying kind of similar to what I was going for, Ananda. Um, so by getting people to work on, uh, volunteers to work on projects as they wish and as they feel kind of moved to do, uh, how do you moderate it? How will you manage people with a completely different agenda? More, I see more and more right-wing stuff pop up on my social media, however much I report it and block it. How, how will you manage the trolling and those who want to abuse the, the decolonization process? Um, what, what will you do about that? How do we all act against that? I think that's the eternal question. Moderation has always been an issue with resources. We're actually in this project not delivering anything online, particularly to uh, a public audience, so we won't have to do that work. I think there is a rebalancing of voices, though, that the more you say and you look out you know, you contest, contested and two sides of the story by actually putting information out there and also unpicking and revealing and making transparent the way we all behave in this. You know, if you say truthfully what's going on, I think we can counter that. But yes, that is really, really a big deal and needs addressing. And I think um, there are some things going on where tagging and all sorts of things is actually disrupting that kind of work at the moment. You can see it happening and a sort of misappropriation, we might call it. But um, I think you can only you can only help through knowledge. So the more we put out there, the, the, the more we can point towards the things that actually explain it. Thank you. Um, Pip, can you have a go at answering this as well? I'm really interested in this because I, in the past I've done a, a managed lot of crowdsourcing projects where we were very worried about what people would say. And of course, they never said anything dodgy. Well, we had one, but, you know, hardly anything. And I just wondered with the whole world of social media and people feeling very free to be able to share their opinions, has that changed crowdsourcing? Is this something that actually is a new concern? Uh, so I think Ananda and you both make excellent points. Um, it's, it's a really good question. I, I w I'm going to guess the answer because my experience is in projects and, and the projects that we've been looking at have been much more structured along the, the Zooniverse is an example, the, the, the Zooniverse platform, but there are many other platforms that do it. And the... Um, it, it's not that you couldn't make mischief um, for any reason, whether politically motivated or uh, because that's what you think is fun, um, or because you didn't understand at all what you were being asked to do, and it's a mistake. But nonetheless, you've um, you know the, the data that's produced is um, isn't perhaps as useful as the people who put the project together hoped for, but. Um, it happens vanishingly rarely on these structured projects. I think it would be a very, it, it will be as people work more with um, with different sorts of uh, different 
with different sources for this data, it, it is it will be very different. When you go to communities, any community that's made its own um, sort of archive online, um, I imagine that they have, I'm sure that they have looked after it carefully and, um, you know, if it's people attached to the to the the hand weaving um, uh, community, for example, um, and they will have curated it themselves. It's a group of people passionate about it. So any um, anyone who came in with another agenda might well um, it would not have been tolerated there. So when you're collecting things that other people have published, it's different. When you're actively using, for example, hashtags on Twitter, that's a different thing. It's not something I've looked at. It would be fascinating to hear what Marta Severo says. She wasn't looking at questions of decolonization. Um, the examples that she gave, sorry, as far as I know, um, uh, the examples that she gave were around um, records of the <laughs> records of the First World War, because it seems we can't get away from them at the moment. Um, but for example, institutions in France, as I've understood it from her, this is nothing I know about at all, can't record circumstances of anybody's death. Um, however, lots of people want to know how and where people involved in warfare um, met their ends. Um, and so they've they've deliberately the people running the project deliberately sort of seeded a hashtag on Twitter and asked people to transcribe things on Twitter which they couldn't do on their institutional site, um, and asked for other contributions um, to it. So where people are using those mixed methods, those mixed mixed crowdsourcing media, um, it, I'm sure it will become more of a um, more of a focus. But currently, even in projects which um, might be seen to be more sensitive. So for example, looking at records of people who were enslaved and, um, and, and sales records from markets and so on. And this is a project projects that are being done in the United States. Um, when, when I've heard, when, I, when I've looked into, into work that um, their work reporting on them, it, it doesn't happen. People don't, people don't come to these sites in order to um yeah to make mischief to to um or deliberately intervene um in in them so um yes what's this space can i follow that up a little bit just quickly um as a sort of overlap from what you've just said uh with your mention of the hand weaving community um i'm part of the knitting community and there has been an absolutely outstanding amount of stuff on social media about cultural appropriation about racism there's been an awful lot of trolling and name calling and it was just insidious it was there already because it's a a bigger group and we might be luckier that some of these echo chambers for want of a better word are smaller in the heritage sector but something that becomes big and international there are people within that with agendas and I you know that's what we're here to address um, so my question was more how do you deal with people who are already inside with opinions that are problematic so this is not this is not something that I've studied. So I, I I don't I don't have an answer for you. So I, I um when I was talking about the, the hand weavers that a, a colleague of mine has has studied um it worked with that with that community, um they have their own digital resource. So then it's not it's not social media where anyone can pile into a conversation. They choose what to publish on it. So so I. I it, I think we're not comparing like with like, and, and it, it may well be that there are um, there are people who would want to intervene in those conversations in, in ways that you describe as problematic um, as well. So it's 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 not something that I have looked at yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you for your question on the chat, Elizabeth. Um, but I'm afraid we don't have time to address it. But if either of the speakers want to send her any kind of quick response on the chat before we shut down, that would be uh, very helpful. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining the seminar and joining the discussion. And particular thanks, of course, to, to all those who have made it through all three seminars and heard about six of our projects. Um, the remaining two projects, when they um, are fully underway and uh, working full time, we will um, organise a seminar in the future for the uh, remaining two projects to report when they're um, ready to do that. So. Just want to say thank you so much for both our speakers, also um, for Ananda for 
um, fielding some of the questions there. And thank you everyone for coming and uh, please stay part of the tank community. Thank you very much.